Okay, so we're going to get started with this week's uh, Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. I just want to welcome everybody this week, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, as you know, we, we put on these monthly sessions, We've been going on now for over a year and a half, and uh, I want to thank all of uh, the, the co-directors that helped me plan these. Uh, Dr. Komatar is the professor and program director here, director of our residency program. Dr. Morco is professor and co-chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, also director of our skull base and uh, cerebrovascular program. And Dr. Benjamin is director of our skull base lab and assistant professor focused on brain tumors and skull base surgery. Uh, additionally, uh, all of the help that goes on with the administration from both the University of Miami Department of Neurosurgery and Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center um, and everybody involved kind of putting these on each week. Uh, these are the people who actually make this happen and I wanna thank them again. Uh, if anybody wants to learn more about the University of Miami or about our webinars, you can always find us on the internet. Uh, we have a YouTube page where all these sessions are stored. I please encourage you to uh, go check them out. Um, and also you can follow us on social media for any questions or updates. As you know, there's two other webinars that we have monthly, a pediatric symposium, as well as a cerebrovascular skull base symposium. And, and this month is no exception. We have a great session coming up on Monday, October 11th, uh, talking about hydrocephalus research advances in future clinical directions, um, as well as uh, Dr. Marcos's uh, skull base and cerebrovascular symposium, which will be on Thursday, October 21st, uh, with a, a debate on cerebrovascular surgery with, with some, of the, some of the grades. So I, uh, definitely please check those out. And just a reminder, our next session will be on November, uh, um, first week, first Wednesday in November, just like every month at 5 p.m. So please be make sure to join us then. For housekeeping, uh, we, we don't offer CME, but you do get an email of participation. We, we encourage you to like, follow, and share. And, and we try to make today as interactive as possible. So please use the Q&A button and we'll try to get to all your questions throughout Dr. Bruce's talk tonight. Uh, start the introductions for tonight. We have a, a group of panelists that are, are all involved with us here at University of Miami. I want to thank them again for joining us. Dr. Higgins uh, is joining us also from Columbia. Uh, well, I'm sure he'll, he'll have uh, some things to say about Dr. Bruce and his teachings uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, Dr. Patel has joined us from Rutgers and Dr. Cater, who's our internal fellow, all uh, great uh, residents and fellows who are here at Miami and will be presenting some cases at the end of tonight's session. So please uh, stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to let Dr. Higgins uh, take over and, and do a, a short introduction here for, for our tonight's special guest. All right. Thanks, Dr. Ivan. And thanks, Dr. Bruce, for uh, joining our uh, lecture series today. It's, a, it's an honor. And it's an honor to be able to introduce my uh, one of my mentors and my former program director from residency at Columbia, Dr. Jeffrey Bruce. Uh, he did his undergraduate studies at University of Virginia and then went on to medical school at UMD and J. Uh, Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, and then he uh, did residency in, in neurosurgery, obviously, at uh, the Neurologic Institute, Columbia Presbyterian, uh, where he then stayed on as uh, faculty um, and uh, has had just you know, a phenomenal career and, and uh, one that we all aspire to, to emulate. And um, Dr. Bruce really uh, holds all those pillars that, that um, I think make it a, an outstanding academic neurosurgeon. Um, he runs an NIH-funded laboratory, he's director of the Brain Tumor Center at Columbia um, and director of the Bartoli Lab um, and conducts, um, you know, cutting-edge research and convection-enhanced delivery um, and uh, immunologic responses to, to chemotherapy and, and brain tumor treatment. Um, and we have a number of projects that we worked on while I was in his lab as well. Um, he's uh, an excellent teacher. He's our program director. Um, uh, for myself and actually for Dr. Komatar too while he was there um, and uh, really has a dedication to, to resident education. We have weekly operative nuances uh, conference despite his busy schedule where um, you know we get the, the grilling uh, every uh, Wednesday morning which um, you have to, to be prepared for so it's actually nice to be able to show him a case now um, and uh, every year we'd, he'd have all the residents out to his house for a retreat where we you know, he takes all of our feedback to, to improve the program. And uh, obviously he's a you know, technical master um, and a skull base expert, um, one of the world leaders in pineal surgery, which he'll be uh, speaking about today. So um, it's a, a privilege to have Dr. Bruce here um, and uh, uh, give us a talk on pineal management.
Okay. Well, Dom, thanks so much for that generous introduction. It's, it's great to see you again, and I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this program today. Um, I'm going to talk about surgical management of, of pineal region tumors. And uh, I have no disclosures. Um, you know, it's the Miami program is very near and dear to my heart, uh, not only because of all my friends there, uh, obviously Rick Comatar and, and Jacques and Alan Levy and Mike Wang and uh, all the other uh, people that are a part of this program. I know they're, they're the kind of the cool kids on the block. They've got this great program in, in Miami and uh, we've sent a bunch of our residents down there for, uh, for additional training, mo mostly uh, softball practice training to, to get their softball skills back up. Uh, but I, I appreciate this. Uh, uh, you know, the publicity for this. I, I'm, I must say, I don't know if, uh, if, if Rick is on here yet, but I don't, I'm not sure about this uh, picture here. You have this picture of a, a brain hollow bread, and I'm trying to understand the significance. I know hollow bread has a lot of very important religious and, and ritual uh, connotations, and maybe it's the because the pineal is the seat of man's soul. Uh, that That's uh, maybe the connection. But anyway, uh, I, I uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the, the nice introduction here. Um, so I wanna start a little bit about some, just some brief history. There's actually a very long and interesting history. We don't have time to go through all of it, but some interesting things. First of all, you know, Victor Horsley was the first person to describe pineal surgery. Uh, it was back in 1910, he gave a little talk at the Royal Society of Medicine Interestingly, it wasn't clear whether he was the one that did the surgery or whether he just described someone else doing it. And uh, apparently was not particularly successful and they had used an infratentorial approach. And he commented that he, in the future, he would, he would have preferred a supratentorial approach. So I don't know, you know, um, if, you, if you look at um, uh, the uh, memoirs of, uh, of Cushing, Cushing uh, had visited Horsley and thought Horsley was actually a horrible surgeon. So uh, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, Walter Dandy was one of the early pioneers. He actually uh, tried this surgery in dogs. He, he, did, he described uh, more of the interhemispheric approach of the pineal in 12 dogs. All of them died, but that didn't stop him from uh, trying this in a, in a few humans, uh, also with not great results. Really, the first person that had any kind of success was uh, Theodore Krauss, and he described three infratentorial uh, approaches in 1926. Uh, only one had successful tumor removal, but they were done without mortality. Uh, and I think after that, the, the procedure was pretty much abandoned. I, I think, you know, Cushing stated that he had never succeeded in exposing a pineal tumor sufficiently well to justify an attempt to remove it. So obviously Cushing was the, was the uh, state of the art at the time, and, and he felt that he he could not, uh, you know, the, the approaches were, were, were not uh, uh, possible with, with, uh, with that. So it really came to, you know, Bennett Stein, who was my chairman and uh, who was a great mentor of mine. He, uh, once the, micro, the operating microscope came into, into, into uh, existence, really, is when he, he rediscovered this approach. And apparently he was doing a poster of FASA must have been a, like a cerebellar met, fairly straightforward case in the sitting position. And after they had removed the tumor, they looked up and, and saw that there was this, uh, you know, great corridor all the way to the pineal. And I, that, that gave them the idea of, of retrying this infratentorial approach in the sitting position. And uh, in 1971, he, he presented a series of six patients. And you can see the, the drawings from that. And in the lower corner here, you can see, you know, Dr. Stein used to draw uh, uh, diagrams and, and figures from all of his surgeries. And, and this was his first surgery uh, for the pineal uh, case. And uh, I, he has, still has this in his notebook back home. Uh, Dr. Stein is retired and he actually is into, into cars and, and was uh, uh, featured in one of these car magazines for all of his uh, uh, fancy cars that he, and, and, and uh, his garage that he has back in, in his home. And he's still, he just, celebrated his 90th birthday recently, and he's still, still going strong. So, uh, uh, but I think we, we owe a big thanks to him for uh, all of the, you know, all of the uh, innovation in this. And, and 
of course, it came only after we had cautery and microscope and, and uh, learned how to, to really uh, provide good hemostasis. And, and that, that approach has, has really become, uh, uh, you know, something that we, that we use all the time now. And, and, you know, we can thank him for that. Um, so the early surgical results were, were poor. This picture here is actually from a, a neurosurgery textbook. And you can see with this technique why some of the early results were, were still pretty poor. And so what happened you know, in the 1940s and 1950s, they would just shunt patients for their hydrocephalus and then just blindly radiate them. And now we realize that having a emphasis on getting an accurate histological diagnosis, because that's going to really guide the management of these patients. So, so uh, having tissue is, is really critical in, in managing these patients. And here you can see, uh, you know, I have a number of patients over the years that came to us years later after they had gotten radiation. And you can see uh, everything from this radiation induced uh, tumor to the leukoencephalopathy and all these problems that occurred in patients years after they got radiation. You know, we're, you're mostly familiar with radiation for glioblastoma where patients, you know, don't naturally, you know, actually live that long to get all of the side effects. But because pineal patients, generally do well, particularly the benign tumors, and you see them, you know, 10, 15 years later, they've got all kinds of problems from, uh, from uh, whole brain and third ventricle radiation. So keeping in mind uh, management of these tumors, it's, first of all, they're, they're a very diverse tumor type that occur in the pineal. In fact, there's probably no area of the brain, maybe even in the body where you get such a wide variety of tumor types. And Generally, this is everything from pineal cell to germ cell, glial cell, and a wide range, anywhere from malignant to benign, a lot of intermediate grade tumors, mixed cell types, particularly among the germ cell tumors where you get benign teratoma mixed in with uh, malignant endodermal sinus tumors, and then throw in a lot of non-neoplastic lesions, you know, vascular lesions, uh, cavernous malformations, uh, benign cysts. And so, uh, having a fairly aggressive surgical approach is, is uh, easily justified given the wide range of, of pathology that you're gonna see in this location. Uh, I just wanna make a quick comment on pineal cysts. I think with, with people getting MRI scans, every time you get a headache, you're, you're seeing more of these pineal cysts. They are uh, occurring in about three or 4% of the population. And you know, unless they're causing hydrocephalus or aqueductal compression, they, they almost certainly are not responsible for whatever symptoms the patient has. And so we've, uh, we've operated on a, 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 a couple of these that were symptomatic and causing hydrocephalus, but generally uh, the advice is to leave them alone unless you want to buy uh, a lot of people with some, some pretty crazy uh, uh, symptoms and, and who, who are not going to get better after your surgery and likely will be worse. Um, here, though, you can see that, as I explained, there are a lot of different tumor types that occur in the pineal, and many of them look alike radiographically. So MRI scan is not really a good way to distinguish among tumor types. Here you can see an ependymoma, pineocytoma, and germinoma, everything from a, from a low-grade to a high-grade malignant tumor, and they, they look fairly the same on, on T1 with and without contrast. So you're not going to be able to predict the histology uh, very reliably. So I would say that diagnostically, a tissue diagnosis is pretty mandatory. Uh, the only exception is when the germ cell markers are positive. And obviously anyone with a pineal tumor should have uh, serum germ cell markers and, and uh, preferably CSF as well. And if the beta HCG and or uh, alpha fetoprotein are elevated, then by definition, this patient has a malignant germ cell tumor, and you don't really need a tissue diagnosis. You can treat them with radiation and chemotherapy. They may require a second look surgery after the adjuvant therapy for any benign elements that are not adequately treated with, uh, with the radiation and chemotherapy. Um, um, but there's no need for a tissue diagnosis in, in that case. So uh, what about the uh, advantages of an open resection? Because we have 
Uh, there's been some debate about just doing a stereo biopsy and radiosurgery. And certainly for certain patients, that's, that's uh, true. But I would say for the vast majority, there's a benefit of open resection. Uh, definitive diagnosis for one. Uh, I don't know about you, but our, our pathologist, you give them a very small piece of tissue from a stereo biopsy, and they have a very difficult time telling you exactly what it is. So having the, uh, being able to get adequate tissue sampling is, is very helpful for uh, establishing an accurate diagnosis. Um, probably slightly more than a third of pineal tumors are benign. So surgery alone is going to be curative for those patients. You can often get a, a very good resection, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And so you're going to, you're going to essentially cure uh, over a third of them with surgery alone. Many non-benign tumors can be completely removed. And in many cases, we hold off on radiation in them. And I would include in that group uh, intermediate pineal cell tumors and some ependymomas. So surgery alone can, can be uh, adequate treatment for some non-benign tumors as well. And when you're talking about the malignant tumors, the, the malignant uh, germ cell tumors or malignant pineal cell tumors, if you look at uh, our long-term follow-up, those patients where we've been able to do a, a very radical resection, they're going to do better in the long run, um, both from the debulking, but also having a better response to radiation and or chemotherapy. And I think in general, we, we can find that the operative risks are acceptable. I think with the current you know, microscopic techniques, the operative risks are, are, are very acceptable. Uh, finally, control of hydrocephalus. Many patients who present with hydrocephalus, if you simply resect the tumor, you don't always need a, a ventricular drain or certainly um, don't need a, a, a shunt in those patients. Uh, just briefly mentioning endoscopic consideration, I think it can be useful for selected cases, particularly some tumors that may be cystic. Uh, they lend themselves well to endoscopic approaches. Uh, once again, you have to worry about sampling error if you're just biopsying the tumor. And the bleeding risks can be considerable because most of the time you're going to be going through the ventricle and all you need is a little bit of blood and it's going to obscure your, your vision. And uh, and obviously affect your ability to get uh, adequate hemostasis. So I think um, there are some very nice articles of people who have described successful approaches endoscopically. And um, you know, I think that we, we need to uh, pay attention to that. Um, but I think in general, uh, you know, my feeling with, with our experience is that in, uh, the open procedures are really gonna be desirable for most of those patients. Um, another advantage is you can endoscopically, is you can combine it with the ETV. Many of our patients have an endoscopic third ventriculostomy prior to the surgery to treat the hydrocephalus and allow the brain to decompress. However, if you're going to try and do a tumor resection at the same time, usually you need a separate burr hole because the, the burr hole you need for your ETV is not going to get you back far enough in most cases. So let me just briefly talk about the anatomy. You know, one of the one of the great things, I mean, I, I really love this surgery, mostly because the anatomy is terrific. Uh, the surgery is, is, is challenging, but the patients generally do well. And you can start with, uh, with the, the nice anatomy. The, the pineal is, is deep at the center of the brain. And if you look at, uh, you know, these are some great pictures from the uh, Roten series, but um, the pineal gland is essentially like an extra axial structure. So when you get a tumor in the pineal gland, you, you ultimately can, if you, if you take advantage of the uh, dissecting the capsule, you can get the, you know, almost an on-block resection of many of these tumors, but more importantly, you can get a complete resection by respecting that, that uh, capsule that exists because the pineal is like a separate structure. Um, here you can see uh, anatomically that the, that the, um, Third ventricle has uh, obviously a very rich uh, venous supply that you have to um, uh, address. And uh, the third ventricle obviously com uh, communicates with the lateral ventricles and the aqueduct. So understanding ventricular anatomy is really an important part of uh, pineal surgery. Um, again, 
not only is the pineal gland a separate structure, but the, as these tumors grow into the ventricle, you have the ventricular surface of these, which, which uh, uh, you know, is not contact, contacting anything but the CSF. So you can leverage that in your, in your tumor dissection. Um, just to uh, move forward, the, the other interesting thing is I think uh, pineal anatomy and surgery is all about respecting all of the vascular structures. And in this view from above, we're here, we're looking at the lateral ventricles from above, the uh, septum pellucidum and the for, uh, fornix have been cut out and reflected posteriorly. We're looking at the roof of the third ventricle and it's formed by the velum interpositum, which contains a layer of the tela choroidea and the posterior choroidal arteries. And the, here you see the internal cerebral veins, which really have to be preserved uh, uh, at all costs. There's always a question, can you sacrifice one or more of these? And uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that because we, we never do. Uh, I think we've had a couple of times where maybe one uh, internal cerebral vein was sacrificed for whatever reason, and there seems to be adequate collateral circulation in that case, but I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't wanna push that. Here you can see, as you dissect out the internal cerebral veins, veins you can see the um, uh, uh, exposed third vent, uh, exposed telechoroidea, and these are all these little vessels that uh, form the choroidal arteries. And this is these are usually where the blood supply to the tumor is. And this can be a little bit of a confounding part of your tumor uh, dissection. I always find that uh, generally the last part of the tumor dissection involves cauterizing. And, and cutting all those little uh, choroidal branches that are usually feeding these tumors. And here's just an overview uh, of the third ventricle. Again, a lot of very uh, fun and challenging approaches, whether it's from the anterior or, or posterior. I think when we're talking about pineal, these are almost always gonna be posterior approaches. And, um, I'm gonna talk about the approaches that I really use the most, which is the occipital transtentorial, which is just a variant of the posterior um, interhemispheric, um, and then the infratentorial supracerebellar approach. So the choice of your surgical approach, whether you come from above or below, will depend a little bit on the uh, experience of the surgeon, but also um, uh, the anatomical location of the, the tumor. Uh, generally, I prefer the supertentorial approach for tumors that are large and that extend supertentorially or extend very far later laterally or have a significant caudal extension. The infratentorial approach is better for midline uh, tumors that are rising ventral to the deep venous system. And so here um, you can see Take this tumor, for instance, this is a you know, fairly large sized tumor, but if you notice, you know, a lot of this tumor is infratentorial. So if you're gonna use an infratentorial approach, it's gonna be hard to get this part of the tumor down here. Uh, you, you can do it by gradually decompressing the tumor, but for a tumor like this, I prefer the occipital transtentorial approach where you come interhemispheric, you open the tentorium, and you're really looking at the, um, the, the geometric center of the, of the tumor. So the advantages of the occipital tentorial approach are you get a broad exposure, you get a good view of the quadrigeminal plate, and you can do this in the prone or I prefer the lateral position for this. And um, in the lateral position, your, your hands are, are sort of parallel to the operative uh, uh, trajectory and uh, you, you have a very comfortable approach. Uh, the disadvantage is that you might see the internal cerebral veins and the precentral cerebellar vein uh, overlying the tumor. You do require a little bit of occipital uh, retraction, and that can sometimes lead to transient visual field defects. Um, and you may have to sacrifice at least uh, one, uh, one bridging vein between the hemisphere and the sagittal sinus. But generally, that, that's not a, a problem. What you do have is some difficulty uh, with, if you have tumors that are extending very far anteriorly, it can be sometimes hard to see that. So you, you have to be a little careful about uh, how far anteriorly the tumor is going to extend. 
So here is uh, the approach I prefer. It's a lateral, uh, lateral approach. I like to have the head turned down so that the nose is, is towards the floor. And that allows the, the brain to naturally um, uh, fall back and retract from the brain. Um, many times I'll use a spinal drain, but not always. I like to have good brain retraction. Uh, I used to use brain retractors all the time. Now I, I don't use brain retractors anymore, um, certainly for pineal surgery. And, and really for most of the tumor surgery I do anymore, I, I try to set it up in a way with enough brain relaxation and the right trajectory so that I don't need uh, a brain retractor and just the natural uh, gravity uh, allows the retraction that I need. Here is the, the exposure. I, I like to extend the craniotomy across the sagittal sinus so that I can get good exposure to the interhemispheric fissure. And there's invariably going to be one uh, bridging vein. You know, my sort of rule of thumb is I, I don't mind taking one vein, but I try to avoid more than one. Uh, I think uh, yeah, I've, I've not never gotten into trouble just taking one vein, um, but I think it, it's, it's wise to avoid uh, a second vein. And you can see by having a wide enough exposure, you can, you can come from a more posterior or more anterior direction. So you can work your way around if you happen to have a lot of veins in your way. Here is uh, the approach after your craniotomy, uh, the brain is retracted here and you're looking at the tentorium. Here is the straight sinus. And essentially what you're gonna do is make a cut parallel to the straight sinus through the tentorium. You can see it nicely on the diagram. And once you do that, you're gonna be looking right at the tumor. And um, the, this can be a little bit tricky because you know the tentorium, the, the leaves of the tentorium that make up the sinus, those, those, that, that sinus can extend a lot more further laterally than you can appreciate here. So you have to be prepared to really cauterize the tentorium before you cut it. Uh, otherwise, you can risk some pretty uh, brisk bleeding. I usually make the cut as far laterally as I can to avoid that. And then I just cauterize the edges of the tentorium right up to the straight sinus. And the, the tentorium will shrink up once you, you cauterize it. And this is kind of what you're, you're looking at. You have the deep venous system here, the corpus callosum. Here's the cerebellum. And here's your, here's your tumor. And you can see you have a nice nice view of that. And here's a, a picture of after the tumor is removed, you're looking, here's the Fox. Again, this retractor is on the, the uh, brain hemisphere. And again, uh, this is an older picture. I don't, I don't use retractors at all anymore in these, in these patients. And here is a, just a brief video to, to kind of show you what we're, what we can see. So here is the tentorium. This is the, uh, um, parietal occipital lobe, here's the fox, and here's the straight sinus here. So we put a stitch here to kind of lift up the tentorium and make it easier to cut into. And we're going to divide the tentorium here. Here you can see 11 blade, we're, we're cutting into the tentorium. And then once the tentorium is open, we can slide a cottonoid under, and I just, I simply use a bovi. It's, it's nice for cutting the tentorium and also getting hemostasis. And here you can see now you have the, the tumor exposed. And uh, again, the third ventricle is here, cerebellum down here, uh, opening into the tumor and de debulking it a little bit. But mostly, I don't try to debulk too much of the tumor at first. I like to use the capsule of the tumor as a way of dissecting from the, the surrounding brain here we've, we've decompressed the tumor, then we're cauterizing the capsule and shrinking it away and trying to remove it almost as an en bloc specimen. And when you have a nice capsule and a nice tumor plane, you can, you can remove these tumors and separate them from the brain stem, from the dorsal midbrain and from the deep venous system. And uh, here's your view. After the tumor is removed, you get this beautiful view into the third ventricle and down the aqueduct. And um, so that, you know, that's really what you can accomplish with the occipital transtentorial approach. Here's a before and after, you, and you can see, so even fairly large tumors can be removed uh, with, this, with this approach. Okay, the, the super cerebellar approach, this is sort of the main workhorse. This is, we've used this approach for probably 80% of our pineal tumors. 
uh, the advantage is it's a direct midline approach. So you're, you're in the midline, it, the anatomy is a lot easier to appreciate from that uh, midline approach. You would avoid the deep veins because you're working underneath the deep venous system. You do have the precentral cerebellar vein, which we'll talk about. And if you do this in the sitting position, gravity allows the cerebellum to, to drop down. And um, you know the sitting position can be a disadvantage for the anesthesiologist, but you know, in the you know, over 200 cases we've done, we've never really had a serious complication related to the sitting position. We've had air emboli, which we've which we've um, uh, treated successfully. Normally, if you have an end tidal PCO2, if you see that going down, you, you flood the field, you make sure you've got good hemostasis so there's not an open uh, vein somewhere that's sucking in air. But um, although we've, we've had multiple times where we've had some transient air embolus, we've never had a serious complication from that. Um, another disadvantage is, is the need to sacrifice a lot of the bridging veins between the cerebellum and the tentorium. And I'll talk more about that uh, later on. So this, this operation can be very difficult if you don't get the right position right from the start. And by the right position, that means getting the head flexed as much as you, as you safely can. I usually have the, the trunk flexed as much as it can. And then I try to flex the neck as much as I can, leaving two finger breaths between the chin and the sternum, to make sure you don't compromise the, the airway. And you almost want the tentorium parallel to the floor. If, if, that, if you don't have enough flexion, this, this approach can be miserable for the surgeon. Here is the, uh, the craniotomy. I usually like it to extend above the transverse sinus and then uh, open the dura in a U-shaped fashion and re reflect it upward. And then here you're looking at the dorsal cerebellum. And you have all of these bridging veins that have to be uh, sacrificed. Here you can see on the close-up. So all of these veins here have to be cauterized and sacrificed. I try to save any veins out laterally so that we maintain as much venous flow as possible. And here's what it looks like after you've uh, retracted the cerebellum. Again, you see this retractor on the cerebellum. Here you can see the tumor, uh, the quadrigeminal plate, and here's the precentral cerebellar vein. Uh, I usually uh, take that, and we once you cauterize and divide that, then you're you're really looking at the tumor itself, and you can see you have this very nice view of of the tumor. Um, you have uh, a large part of it already exposed, and what you really want to do is uh, find the tissue plane between the uh, dorsal midbrain here and the tumor. And I usually try to dissect this as much as possible before I internally debulk it, because again, taking advantage of that uh, capsule interface uh, allows you to get the, the most radical uh, resection. And here's your view after the tumor's remo removed. You can see this nice view into the, into the third ventricle. I'll sometimes use a mirror to look downward to make sure there's no, no clots or no tumor sitting over the aqueduct. And uh, here's the post-op. And here's a, also a brief video just to sort of give you a, a flavor for what this looks like in, uh, in, in video. So you, uh, I, I start by trying to exploit this, this plane here, uh, dissecting out the, the, the tumor, taking any small vessels that are, that are um, uh, connecting the tumor to the surrounding uh, brainstem. And then once you establish a plane and are into the third ventricle, then uh, it's a matter of dissecting around the tumor. The hardest part is the, the part superiorly and all of these little vessels, and they, they all have to be cauterized and, and uh, divided. And this, this bulk, these vessels are coming off the choroid and they can bleed uh, a lot. So it's very, very important to get hemostasis of that. And then you can remove the, the tumor almost on block after you've got that established that nice plane. And uh, here you can uh, see again, this nice view into the, into the third ventricle. So um, those are, I think the, those approaches, the occipital transtentorial and the super cerebellar infratentorial, I would say, you know, 99% of the pineal surgery we've done have been uh, one of those approaches. So, um, 
you, I've showed you these nice videos and, and told you how elegant the surgery is. So what, what could possibly go wrong, right? Here is a patient that presented with a hemorrhagic tumor. Uh, she had uh, a blockage of her aqueduct, acute hydrocephalus, uh, but not in terrible shape, but she's got this fairly uh, well circumscribed tumor and you know pretty straightforward, right? Um, uh, here you can see the exposure, uh, infratentorial supracerebellar approach, uh, a nice view of the, of the tumor, and, uh, and it's completely resected. Postoperatively, she looks great, and uh, she's in the ICU awake and talking. This is uh, you know, right after the surgery. And then about uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, she becomes unresponsive, and we've got this. And what you see there is this essentially a venous infarct of the cerebellum. And this turned out to be a real tragedy because that venous infarct extended into the brainstem. Uh, and ultimately, uh, long story short, her family made a decision to um, uh, withdraw care. And ultimately, she died from this venous infarct. And what that... Um, what that was from is uh, from from all of the the venous um, structures that we presumably took to get to this approach. And what I found is we've we've done over two hundred of these approaches, and we've had this happen twice. And so this tells me that that most patients have plenty of collateral venous drainage, but about one percent of the population, if you take their midline cerebellar veins to get to this approach, one in a hundred patients is going to have a severe venous infarct and potentially fatal. So um, now, you know, dealing with pineal tumors, these are difficult tumors. They're, they're high risk in a lot of ways, but to have a 1% mortality related to that, you know, made us think, well, maybe we have to rethink this, this approach. And so we started looking into the lateral supracerebellar infratentorial approach. And this is essentially the same approach, but instead of from the midline, it's, uh, it's lateral. And what, what you do here is the, the incision is made uh, midway between the, the midline and the, um, the sigmoid sinus. And you need a much smaller opening, much smaller craniotomy, but extends above the transverse sinus. And this is the view laterally. Um, you can see the cerebellum uh, uh, coming away from the uh, tentorium and you ha don't have any veins in your way because the veins are all midline over here. But by coming laterally, and, and if you think about how the tent is, the tent is, is this very angular structure. So by coming laterally, you actually get a lower trajectory, which can be very useful for when you have tumors that are extending into or standing above the dorsal midbrain. Here again is Roten's anatomy. You can see it's, it's, it's a tricky approach because it's the corridor is smaller and you still have all of these, these vessels to work around. And uh, here is the, again, here's the view. Here is what this, what this looks like. And so you have to, you have to find a very narrow uh, course between these veins because you really can't, you really don't, certainly don't want to sacrifice any of the arteries and you don't want to sacrifice any of these uh, veins. But um, with, uh, under the microscope, you have a, a, a small corridor, but this is essentially the tumor here. And here you can see what this looks like after you've removed the tumor. So it's, it's a little bit more challenging, but a much safer approach. And I think that uh, having had a lot of experience with pineal surgery before I tried this approach, I, I, I found that um, you know, we were able to do this uh, not only successfully, but I think this would have been harder to do if, 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 if when I was first starting out doing pineal surgery, I tried to do them from a lateral approach. Here you can see postoperatively, you can see uh, the, the, uh, all the deep veins are intact, and here's the precentral cerebellar vein, so the tumor's out, but you haven't sacrificed all of the deep venous system. And uh, here, just a, another quick video. So here, sorry, here is uh, what this looks like under the scope. You have the cerebellum 
And again, no retractors. And um, you have one small bridging vein here, which is not a problem. We're going to cauterize that. And then here is under the microscope, you can see dissecting the tumor from around all of the arachnoid, opening the arachnoid widely, seeing the bottom of the, the tumor, and then internally debulking the tumor a little bit here. If you have a, if you have a large tumor and, and, and need to see that um, capsule better. So internal debulking of the tumor, and that allows everything to decompress. And then we simply keep working around the, the capsule of the tumor. In this case, you can see now we're in the ventricle. You can see the CSF welling up there. And um, it's a matter of making sure then that you exploit that, that plane. And here's looking into the uh, third ventricle after the tumor is removed. Uh, and again, you have a nice, a nice view. And this, this is the approach we use much more often now. The only time we would not use this approach now is if we had a really large tumor, in which case the occipital transcentorial, or in which case you can justify the midline approach if, uh, if that's what's gonna be necessary if you have it for a large tumor. Uh, again, the veins intact. So let me sort of uh, begin to finish up here by, you know, this is our, our series of, uh, of benign, uh, uh, and malignant tumors overall, uh, a, a radical subtotal resection, meaning radiographic resection or gross total resection in 92% of benign tumors and about two thirds of malignant tumors. So overall about, uh, you know, over three quarters of these tumors can be radiographically removed. Uh, in, in 205 patients, we've had two operative related, 2% uh, operative related deaths. So that's four patients out of 205, one had a PE, you had the two that I talked about with the venous infarct. And um, you have a, a number of patients with permanent major morbidity, 2%. two percent. Um, what you have though is a, a fair number of patients with transient major morbidity. So about 8% of patients have, you know, can be fairly sick in the ICU. And this can be a combination of a lot of air in the ventricle or, or um, midbrain swelling. And most of them will recover if you, if you have a, a good ICU team and, and get them through uh, that, that post-operative period. So if you look at benign tumors, and this is everything from teratomas to epidermoids, pilocytic astrocytomas, 100% uh, 10-year tumor-free survival following complete resection. And, and that accounts for about 40% of all pineal tumors that we've seen. And then among malignant tumors, the five-year survival is 75%, 10-year uh, survival, 62%. And radiographic resection is 66%. A lot of this is weighted towards the fact that germinomas, which which account for a large percentage of pineal tumors, are so radiosensitive. So essentially, that's probably one of the rare malignant tumors in the in the whole body that are cured with uh, with radiation. And so, um, just to kind of summarize. I would say that the surgical approach options are based on the location of the tumor and anatomically where it's, extend, it's extending, and, and of course, the surgeon experience. Very important to look for the tumor capsule brain interface. I think that's the whole secret to, to successful pineal surgery is working the, the, the tumor plane, the interface. Uh, tumor debulking to facilitate that. Um, avoiding retractors, especially on the midbrain and any of those uh, sensitive uh, third ventricle structures, uh, respecting vascular structures, arteries, and of course the veins. The veins are, 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 are very important in this location. And the venous, venous infarct is an unpredictable and devastating complication in 1% of patients. I don't even know that there's any, anything you can do preoperatively, uh, uh, MRV, uh, any kind of uh, angiogram that's going to actually predict which of these patients are going to be in that, that group of 1%. And I think you can avoid this complication by using the, the occipital transtentorial approach or the lateral suboccipital approach uh, for, for tumors that extend into the third ventricle. So 
Again, in summary, I would say a histological diagnosis is mandatory. Uh, aggressive surgical approach results in a long-term survival, greater than 70% 10-year survival, and that's all pineal tumor patients. So they're all, so as a group, they're going to do well, but especially the, the um, benign tumors. Uh, the surgical morbidity is acceptable. Um, I think, uh, you know, 2% uh, mortality, 2% major morbidity and uh, favorable results are going to be uh, achieved by using these state-of-the-art microsurgical techniques. Um, so with that, I will say uh, thanks to all of our residents, staff, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, taking care of these patients and getting them through a difficult surgery, you really rely on, a, on your resident staff and, and, and your OR and ICU people. And uh, here is our, this is our, from our softball tournament, our great team. Here you can see, uh, uh, I wanted to show the, the Miami team. I think this is after they won the championship. And uh, they're, I don't know what the, what this is, it's some kind of a, uh, like a cool people sign or a gang sign, or I don't know, maybe, maybe it just means we need more challah bread. Uh, but uh, these are our, our, a great, great warrior group. Um, and. Um, with that, I'll take any, any questions. Thanks so much. That was a, a great talk, Dr. Bruce. Really appreciate it. And, and congrats on all your, your success and with those outcomes. It's, those are tremendously difficult surgeries. Um, a couple of questions that have come up here on the, on the Q&A was uh, for, for redo surgeries in this area or when recurrences happen, do you, do you tend to change your approach? And, and if you did occipital transcentoral go to a suboccipital approach or, I mean, obviously depends on the tumor location, but do you try to avoid the same kind of a, a approach angle uh, for these areas? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think in general, um, all things being equal, if you can use a different uh, trajectory, a different corridor, I always prefer that. Uh, on the other hand, if, you know, especially if, it, if, if you have a previous infratentorial approach and the veins have already been taken, so you know you already have a straight corridor, it's, it's not the, the worst thing in the world to come through that same approach. And, and normally you don't have that much scar tissue because, uh, you know, the, because it's all ventricular surface. Uh, and once you, you know, once the cerebellum is, is away from the tentorium, you, you have that nice corridor there. But, but yeah, I, I think in general, any kind of reops, but in pineal, if I can use a different trajectory, I usually like to. And, and, for the, you know, for the residents, I always feel like it's, it's difficult to know how big to make the dural opening. You know, a lot of times they make it either too low or they not low enough. What, you know, I saw you put gel film in there because you're always worried about compression of the cerebellum on the tentorial on the, on the dural edge. How do you tell your residents to kind of make that opening just in the right position so that it's not too big or too small or, or whatnot? Yeah. So, so, you know, as, as over time, I, I see uh, Jacques there and I think Jacques Marcos will, will tell you as, as you, as you get more and more experience, you do everything through smaller and smaller approaches and incisions. So the, the interesting thing about the uh, infratentorial approach is, you know, the, when you open the dura, the, the, uh, the dura acts kind of like a sling and it, and it allows the cerebellum to sort of cradle it. And so, um, what I find is that I don't need a large dural opening. What you need is a little bit, uh, a little bit more of the, the craniotomy needs to be large enough so that the dura, once it's open, will just relax and, and cradle the cerebellum. And so um, I just make enough of a, a dural opening, a U-shaped opening, so that so that you you essentially kind of can reach into the into the cerebellum. But the the opening is going to naturally fall back, so you don't need a big opening. And I I don't like exposing the the dorsal cerebellum. Any, any, basically, any time you have brain exposed that doesn't need to be exposed, it's it's sort of a, a natural place to get stabbed with a cautery or a a freer or something. So keeping it keeping it covered is is really important. Jock, did you want to make some comments yeah. to that? Yeah, anyway? Jeff, wonderful talk, by the way. Thank you very much for joining us on this very popular series that Mike has put together. Um, you know, I, I have not, I don't think I've used the sitting position in maybe 15 years. Uh, I've really been very happy just with the Concord position, but the true Concord, not a true prone. And then getting CSF from Cisterna Magna without doing 
the craniotomy down to cisterna magna and I just, you know, the anesthetic hassle of the city. And of course, in your at your place, they're used to that sitting position and so forth. But I, I've not, I've not really regretted it. But oh, any comments? I mean, as you know, our friends, the Europeans, Marco Tetajiba, by the way, whose name I saw among the participants, uh, of course, is a huge proponent uh, of the sitting position as well. He, he, yeah. he actually doesn't like it. He doesn't like the word sitting. He he teaches a course. He says the slouching position. He would yeah. have the head level with the feet, you yeah. know? Well, so, so, so you know, um, I mentioned Ben Stein and Ben did really the hard work because back when he was doing sitting position in the late 70s, early 80s, yeah, the anesthesiologist uh, fought him all the time. And he just, you know, he Ben was Ben. He was going to have his way no matter what. And so he kind of trained the anesthesia. So by the time that I was doing them in the early 90s, the anest anesthesiologists were comfortable with the position. And, uh, you know, when end title PCO2, when you, when, you, when you started to be able to, to uh, monitor that, it became a lot easier. You didn't have to wait for uh, uh, un un until, the, uh, un until you, you had the, um, uh, until, you, until you could hear, hear the air on the ultrasound. And so, uh, you know, we naturally just would, came up with a, with a group that already uh, accepted that. Um, I, I would say, uh, have you tried lateral position for the infratentorial approach, shock? Because that would seem to me that the way I, I would uh, think about it. Yeah. Do, do you like lateral position? The, 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 heavy, the high BMI patients, I put them three-quarter prone or lateral, as you say. Yeah. The relatively yeah. normal body habitus, you know, prone with concord with that, with that flexion. Um, yeah, I, yeah. You know, and, and again, no self-retaining retractor, as long as we get CSF out. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I always have to make a decision. Sometimes I'll put a spinal drain if I feel like it's going to be too tight and then I am going to have to, and then it's going to be too hard to get CSF off uh, um, from the cistern before I can, you know, safely do it. I'll put a spinal drain in, but um, it, it, it varies. Yeah. You, uh, brain, it, it, brain relaxation is essential for this, for these approaches. No question. You're deep, deep in the center of the brain. You have to have good brain relaxation. And in fact, I would say if, if you're starting out in, in your practice and it's early on and you're doing one of these and you have a lot of brain swelling before you even start, I, I would say back out and either in a reassess, come back another day, try a different approach. But uh, you're not you're not going to achieve the, the, the your, your goals if you if you have too much brain swelling. Dr. Bruce, fantastic talk. So you and along those lines, you said um, you don't always use the lumbar drain. Do you base that off of BMI or is there anything preoperatively that suggests to you when, when you do or versus when you don't use the lumbar drain? Uh, it, you know, uh, so most of these patients already have an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. I would say more than half, probably two thirds, three quarters. So if I'm comfortable that the brain has relaxed enough, I, I'll, I'll, you know, and, and, and normally when you have this massive hydrocephalus, you do your ETV, everything is, is relaxed. And so usually you don't need a spinal drain. Probably I'm more inclined to use a spinal drain in somebody who's got either early hydro or mild hydro. And I know that I'm just, once the tumor's out their hydrocephalus is going to go away, but uh, I'm, I'm concerned that there's going to be too much, um, you know, uh, the, the brain's going to be too tense. So uh, if there's an ETV, First, or certainly some patients come with us who have already been shunted or have a ventric draining for whatever reason. Those patients don't need it. But if, if they don't, then I, then I would seriously consider uh, a spinal drain. And do you uh, typically go from the non-dominant um, occipital transtensorial side? Um, is there yes, a first in general, in, yeah, in general, coming from the non-dominant side, unless, unless the tumor extends uh, to the other side, um, uh, to extent where, where it makes it more sensible to come from the opposite side. Interestingly, it's, you know, the, the contralateral side is generally easier to get to. So, um, uh, you know, you, you have to keep that in mind when you're, when you're making that decision. Thank you. Okay. So let's, uh, let's get to some of the cases. Uh, Dom, do you want to go first? Yes, yeah, sure thing. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Well, thanks, Dr. Bruce. A great talk, and it's great to hear, you know, some of the things you've kind of ingrained in us. Um, in a I think that might have been you in one of the videos, Dom. 
Is that you in look, one of the videos? Look the pretty lateral? slick, so probably. <laughs> probably the, the, hands, the hands weren't, weren't the shaking as much as usual, though, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right. So we have a, um, so a patient of Dr. Comitar is a 40 year old lady with um, sudden onset headache and double vision, neurologically intact with um, you know, negative markers on workup. Um, and uh, here's the scan that shows a you know, mostly homogeneously enhancing uh, lesion in the pineal region without a significant hydrocephalus of note. Um, kind of want to get your thoughts and, you know, kind of a sense of what you think and kind of discuss some of the nuances of the pathology um, after we go through the approaches. Yeah, so um, you can see that the tumor is, is really in the, very much in the third ventricle rather than the quadridermal cistern. So I think an occipital transtentorial approach, it's going to be very, it's going to be difficult to reach the anterior margin of this tumor. So this is a, a tumor that really lends itself to the infratentorial approach. It's not that big. So I would definitely use a lateral uh, supracerebellar approach for this, uh, for this tumor. Um, again, if you're not comfortable with that approach, you can use the midline approach with all those caveats that, that, I've, uh, that I talked about. But uh, I think this is kind of an ideal for a lateral uh, supracerebellar uh, approach. Um, and, uh, so they, uh, did a, a super cerebellar for tentorial. It was a midline, um, but, you know, neurologically, uh, did well postoperatively got a radiographic gross total. Um, uh, we talked about, you know, spinal drains, uh, beforehand. Um, and so what about, um, like postoperative EVDs, um, in a patient that doesn't have a prior ETV or, or drains, what's your, what's your thought on, on those? Yeah, so that's, that's a little bit of a problem, right? Because uh, this patient, first of all, it's an excellent surgical uh, outcome. It uh, looks like an, a very nice surgery. And, um, and, and this patient is going to do great. But in the first 24 to 72 hours, she may have enough you know, swelling or even a little bit of blood in her aqueduct that would give her a, acute hydrocephalus. So you generally like to have some kind of a, a relief valve. And that is whether, you know, whether you put a ventric drain in uh, at the time of surgery or have one uh, afterwards. I would say if you don't have a, a drain, then you, gotta, you have to watch this patient closely in the ICU because she's going to wake up with uh, and probably going to be fine. And it may take a few hours for hydrocephalus to become a parent. So if you choose not, if, if you don't have any kind of diversion here, if you don't have a ventricular drain and hasn't had an ETV, then, uh, you know, you need, your ICU needs to be on hyper alert and um, everybody needs to know, uh, you know, a ventric drain uh, at the first sign of uh, trouble. Right. Yeah. And uh, they did put in a, a interop uh, EVD uh, went uh, using a Fraser burr hole. So uh, ultimately didn't need it, but you know, agreed it's, it's, um, Nice to have that reassurance uh, uh, should you need it. Um, yeah. And then uh, I'll go back to the pre-op MRI. You mentioned you know it's it's really hard to tell uh, off the pre-op scans what's the you know predicted pathology. Um, and um, there was a, a nice paper out of uh, from the group here led by Dr. Ivan and and our, our resident uh, Victor Liu and uh, some of our past brain tumor fellows uh, Evan and, and Dan and then our current research fellow Alexis. And, um, looking at um, the cancer database, the National Cancer Database, and outcomes for PPTIDs, and I know you have a, a you know, one of the largest series of those and, and outcomes, and there's a clear like differentiation um, between a grade threes and twos, and also extent of resection uh, makes a difference. So, um, in terms of like, you know, going into the surgery or intraop when you you don't have that sense of you know how aggressive it's going to be from the grade, like does that alter you, you know, your, your surgical strategy in terms of trying to push the boundaries if there's you know, some invasion um, into like the thalamus or some of the parenchyma or you kind of let the tumor dictate how much you're gonna, you know, you're gonna remove. Yeah, for, for sure. Just go back to this, the scans again. Yeah, so, so this, this looks like a pretty well circumscribed tumor. I, and I would feel like that I'm, I'm, my mindset going into this case is gonna be, I wanna really look carefully for the tissue planes and try and get a radiographic resection on this. And uh, go to the, the next slide. The next slide is, so this is your post-op mm -hmm, scan. Yeah. It looks like you got a nice clean, so you, yeah. you did this with Comitar? No, no, Comitar he, 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 <laughs> he really? did it without me, but yeah. Wow. <laughs> I guess he taught us something, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's impressive. Um, 
so yeah, I would go in with the mindset now with a, with a, with a grade three. So, so um, is this intermediate grade two or, or grade three, I would say would be, a, you know, uh, malignant. So this is, this is a grade two or grade three. They call it a grade three on the pathology uh, report. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So grade three, I think you're going to, you're going to have to radiate them. If it was a grade two, I would, I would think about watching it and then giving focal radiation at the first sign of recurrence. Okay. The problem with a grade three is you, you, you know, you have, if you're going to do a fractionated radiation, you really have to treat the whole tumor bed and then, you know, two centimeters, which essentially is whole ventricular radiation. And, and that, okay. that, you know, that's a, can be fairly morbid over a long term, especially in a patient like this is who's likely to do very well. Um, but I think grade three is going to dictate that you have to be aggressive uh, radiation wise. I, you know, we're, we're in the process of reviewing our entire series, and I'd have to look back to see if we had any grade three tumors that we decided to watch. I mean, the alternative is to watch them closely and then do focused radiation, or the first sign of recurrence. Uh, but I think you're, you're getting a little bit, um, it, it's a little bit harder to support that for a grade three. And in fact, a lot of people would argue for craniospinal radiation in this group. You, sh you should do a, you know, a, a spine um, survey anyway, to make sure there's no uh, uh, spine metastasis. But uh, a lot of people think, uh, you know, a grade three pineal parenchymal uh, deserves craniospinal radiation. Mm -hmm. There's no definitive proof either way. We've, we've looked at it, but, um, you know, that's, that's sort of what the conventional wisdom would tell you. Yeah, it was great to see that series. Um, but she, she actually did get fractionated radiation afterwards, um, has, you know, several years out now and, and no um, recurrence as far in the spine scans were negative. So uh, pretty good outcome. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Mike, do you want to go next? I know you have to run to the OR shortly. And just unmute yourself too. Hey, Dr. Bruce, great talk. Um, Mike, sorry. good to see you again. How's everything? Yeah. Everything's great. Everything's good. good. Very happy down here. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to present a case here. This is a 22-year-old uh, male who no had some issues with his right eye movement. Uh, he was also having intermittent headaches and changes in vision, so he went to his optometrist. Um, they noticed that papilledema there, and uh, he got an MRI, which is shown here. Um, so I guess the main question is, you know, this guy has hydrocephalus, he's a young guy. So I, we're suspecting at this point, some sort of embryological tumor potentially. Um, would you go for open biopsy would, or would you tempt a needle biopsy or do an ETV and try to reach the tumor that way? I was wondering what your, your thoughts on this were. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming the, the germ cell markers were negative. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in a 20 year old male with a tumor that looks like this, I'd say this is a pretty high likelihood of being a germinoma. And with the, with the markers being negative, then it's, it's probably a pure germinoma, which means it's going to be exquisitely radiosensitive. Um, it's hard to get a complete resection of these because they're invasive into the thalamus. So, so you, in terms of, uh, aggressive surgery, uh, first of all, um, it's probably not necessary because you, because they're radio sensitive, but secondly, um, you know, it's, it's hard to find a plane. You can see on this tumor, you don't really see a nice tissue plane that, that you, that you like to see for, for uh, pineal tumors. And, um, in this case, I would do an ETB because he's got hydrocephalus and, you know, shunts, uh, shunts should be avoided at all costs for pineal tumor patients. I think everybody is aware that ETVs can be safe and easy and, and by far the preferred method of dealing with hydrocephalus. Um, so what I would do though, is I would do a stereotactic biopsy coming from a, a, uh, a, a, a coronal, um, about the coronal suture and, and a little bit laterally so that my trajectory is coming laterally into the tumor and not going through any ventricular surfaces because these, these are fairly vascular tumors and I'd rather have a needle biopsy coming through the thalamus where any, even a small bit of, of bleeding is gonna be tamponaded by, by tissue pressure 
rather than coming through the ventricle where you, you do a simple biopsy through the ventricle on the ventricular surface, a little bit of blood and suddenly you can't see what you're doing. And suddenly your uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy is, is closed up. So um, just to summarize, I would do an ETV and then a, a, uh, a, a needle biopsy coming through the, um, coming through a coronal, uh, lateral coronal uh, trajectory. Yeah. So actually, you know, we did the ETV, um, you know, we sent CSF from the ETV. We were concerned about doing a lumbar puncture and someone with uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, but when the markers came back, that's actually what we did. We did a stereotactic needle biopsy of this lesion, which confirmed the diagnosis of germinoma and he had radiation. He's been in remission ever since. Yeah. Great. That's a, you know, that's a great, great management. That's the ideal management for this patient. He's going to do great. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's your thoughts on endoscopic biopsy at the time of ETV for somebody? I mean, obviously, this anatomy is a little bit challenging because it's it's got that weird angle to it. But um, is that also what you were kind of alluding to that the endoscopic biopsy it could lead to bleeding in the ventricle, and and so it's uh, yeah. yeah. So so that I mean, I think that's the thing. Your your biopsy, you're, you're going to be entering the tumor. There's going to be bleeding, and and even a little bit of bleeding in the ventricle is just hard to control, and yeah. For, and especially for all, all you're trying to do is get a biopsy. So I, I don't, I don't see a great advantage to, to that. Even, even, even if you could do it through a single burr hole, um, yeah. this tumor extends far an, an, anterior, anteriorly. So you might be able to, but you'd be, you'd be straining better to do the easy ET, ETV right through the, the normal trajectory. And then, and then, a, you know, a completely different approach. Okay. Thanks. Hey, Jeff, do you have any experience with that rare pathology, papillary tumor of the pineal region? Yes. That's, that's, you, you, yeah. I have, what, what do you, what, what's your experience with it? I only have two patients. I was going to tell you about one of them in a second. Yeah, I, I think it, they, you know, they, they fit into that same uh, grading category. So if it's a grade two, and I felt like we've got a nice, you know, uh, capsular resection or, or radiographic resection, we follow them and uh, and do gamma knife at the first sign of recurrence. And uh, we have a number of patients that we're following that way. Some have been years out and never required radiation. Some of them have got got radio surgery, you know, two three years out. Uh, again, if if they if if the patho if the histology is more malignant, then you know then we we're more aggressive with the radiation. But the, but the same the, the the same thing. I, I guess the the papillary tumors can the the thing about them is they. They, they don't have a, a um, uniform um, uh, natural history. Some of them are aggressive and some of them are not. And the histology is not always uh, as predictive as, as you might hope it would be. Yeah, they think, well, at, at least one of my two is extremely aggressive in spite of being radiated. And I'm going to operate on her a third time now. Uh, in two weeks, she, she's followed, both of them are followed at the NIH. NIH has a high interest in the, in this pathology, but uh, I was curious what your experience was. Did it have, has the, as the third reop, has she had radiation? What, what kind of radiation has she had? She's had both gamma knife and fractionation. Young woman, actually, mm. a young nurse. Wow. I removed, yeah. I, I was not the first surgeon. I was a second surgeon. Um, I was very aggressive. Uh, maybe I left a tiny ditzel in the thalamus and now it's back. And yeah. um, anyway. Yeah, those are hard. Okay, uh, Nitesh, are you there? Uh, he had to, to run to the OR uh, as well. Um, okay. I don't know if you want me to show it from, I don't think I have his slides. So. Oh, it's okay. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jacques, did you say you wanted to, to show a case or? Oh, no, no, that was just my question about uh, just a theoretical okay. question. I don't have a case presented. We have a couple minutes, so I have, I have one too. I'll just uh, kind of show real quick. So, um, you know, this is a 54 year old patient of mine, female who presents with headaches in, in this large falcal tentorial meningioma. Um, uh, you know, I think you, we discussed pretty nicely your, your approach to these. Uh, the question is more is, you know, so we got a preoperative angio just to kind of understand some of the, the veins uh, within the tumor and to see if the, the vein of gallon is secluded. And we, we kind of, from the angiogram, it, it looked like everything was gonna be pretty quiet. 
in there. And, and I was just wondering, you know, what is your, do you, what is your role for angio for some of these large meningiomas in this area and, and, and role for uh, taking some of the other veins uh, when you think they are occluded? Yeah, so this, yeah, this is a, a, a very challenging case. Falcotentorial meningiomas, yeah, they're, they're, they're a little bit, a little bit more nuanced than, than tip, just typical pineal tumors because you really, th these tumors are all about dealing with the, with the, with the venous system. Uh, if you're lucky, like in this case, the, the veins are already uh, occluded. And so I think you can be much, much more aggressive with um, resecting the tentorium and even, even coming across the, uh, so the, these tumors are attached to the tentorium. When you think about the tentorium and the falcs coming together as a triangle, when, when you have to preserve the straight sinus, essentially you have to skeletonize it and, and work around it to take these, tumor, to take these tumors out. When you have a, a big tumor like this that's occluded the, the, uh, the straight sinus and the, the deep venous system, I, I think you have a lot more leeway. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I usually just come, uh, after internally debulking the tumor, I simply come around and, and cut it at the falx and then cut it at the tentorium and then go to the other side and, and, and cut the tentorium around it as well. So it's a lot easier to, to work the the actual tentorium and, and falsine um, uh, planes with this and actually cut that and, and, you know, th and then resect the, the, the tumor that way. Um, uh, again, with enough internal debulking. And I, I, I think that um, it's, it's, but it's, a, but I think that the point is it's attached to all these areas. It's attached both right and left tentorium and the falx at the same time. So all of those have to be, have to be cut at some point if you're going to get this tumor out. But I uh, definitely need an angiogram on these uh, ahead of time, and you need to know the venous anatomy. So if the straight sign is no longer intact, much, much, much more difficult operation, and you're probably not going to get a gross total. Yeah, so, you know, the angio was good quality, and, and we were hopeful, like you said, that everything was going to be out. But when we got in there, we found that this, this vein here in the middle, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, was actually open, and the vein of the gallon was open, and the straight sinus was open. And so uh, we did have to leave this residual kind of on the back, you can see in the bottom here, uh, on the back of that's to where the vein of Galen and straight science kind of came together because it wasn't completely open, but we were able to open the faults, both tentorial edges and try to get out, you know, a good resection, she did well. Uh, patients five years post-op and this is starting to now grow again. So we radiated that uh, at this point in time. Yeah, I would say for most of these falcotentorial uh, meningiomes, we, we have a, a, a number of them over the years. That is by far the hardest part that where, where, where this tumor gets tucked in, where the vein of gale and straight sinus all come together, you, you, it's very difficult to resect that last little piece without getting uh, severe uh, venous bleeding. So I would say um, at, at this day and age, it probably makes a lot of sense to just leave that there and, uh, and, and plan on doing gamma knife uh, either you know, uh, in the post, you know, in, in, in soon after the post-op or, or just waiting for it to grow. I think that's a perfectly, probably the, the desired way to manage these patients. I have a number of patients exactly like that, where we, you, you have that little nodule right at the, uh, the venous complex. That's a good outcome. Right. right. And th that's, that's the other, that's the other caveat for these, the, these falcotentorium, they always have a great plane because they're they're, they're growing into the atrium or into the third ventricle. So all of the surfaces are these nice ventricular surfaces. And once you debulk the tumor, you, you, it's easy to find that plane. And these patients do, do quite well. And that's also why you, these tumors are often very big because in this location, uh, you can, uh, patients can tolerate a pretty big tumor before they become symptomatic. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And uh, I think the angiogram was definitely definitely important, although uh, we were, we had to customize our plan once we got in there, which was, I think, important as well to kind of realize that those veins are, are, are critical. Uh, okay, any other questions? All right, thanks. Well, I, Dr. Bruce, thank you again so much. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, it was a phenomenal talk and, and we, we appreciate you sharing all of your experience and knowledge about this complex area. Um, so thank you again. Be safe, and, and we'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everyone. Good to see Thanks, you. Good to see you all. Yeah. Stay safe. Bye now.